They say Latin is a dead language, as dead as the Romans, you might say. But what if I told you that right now, in the 21st century, Latin is alive and kicking with a secret society of fluent Latin speakers roaming the streets? This is the scintillating story of how Latin lived, how Latin died, and why it's a language you really should be paying attention to. First, let's make an important distinction about languages. There is dead and then there is extinct. Now, extinct languages have no living speakers at all, no written use, and usually no descendants. Latin is not extinct. Latin is a bit like your great grandmother who may be long gone, but her features are still there every day when you look in the mirror. Latin left tons of linguistic DNA in languages that we speak today, including English. So really it's like a golden thread connecting the past to the present. And if you think no one speaks Latin anymore, well, you really need to meet this guy. Salve. Lucius Amadeus Ranieriusum, Americanusum, said Latine locor. Et cur locor Latine? Quia mi placet. Not to mention everyone who likes a bit of a ghost hunt. If that is, Latin is a ghost. After 2,700 years, it might be something else. Stick around, we're going to solve this mystery. And after all the intrigue, you'll hear someone speaking modern Latin. Why don't you take a wild guess at how many people can speak it fluently? How many do you think? Guesses in the comments, please. But as you know, I like to begin right back at the beginning. A very long time ago, in the 10th century BC, there was an Italic tribal group called the Latini, or Latins, who settled in an area called Old Latium, which was on the left bank of the River Tiber in Italy. This is where Rome would later be built and where Roman civilization started. Their ancestors were tribes who migrated into the Italian peninsula during the Late Bronze Age. There were many Italic groups settling all over the peninsula at roughly the same time. They were from the Indo-European language family and spoke various Italic languages. And this particular group living in Latium spoke archaic Latin. Now, at the time, Oscan and Umbrian were the most widely spoken Italic languages. There were also a few non-Italic languages like Gaulish and Ancient Greek, and one language that would give Latin a serious run for its money. A mysterious borrowed language that has no known relatives, dead or alive, and if you know what it is, well, don't tell anyone yet. So this was the Latins' home. They lived on a plain between the volcanic hills and lakes of the region. It's thought that Latini originally meant men of the plain. One small community in particular lived on the slopes of the Palatine Hill, the safest and most desirable neighborhood, apparently with ultra-fast broadband as well. Now, over the years, it was a place where many palaces, temples, and villas were built. In fact, it's this very hill from which we get the word palace. And just look at that golden thread already beginning. Now, this was no ordinary hill. Have you ever heard the story of Romulus and Remus, those orphaned twins who were cared for by a wolf? Of course you have. Well, legend says that when he grew up, Romulus founded Rome in this very place, and Rome was actually named after him. There is a long lost cave underneath the ruins, the legendary Lupercal cave, where the wolf kept the twins. The legend also said that there was a fire-breathing cannibal giant named Cacus who lived in another cave there and terrorized all the inhabitants. Now, among the dozens of languages being spoken in the region, Latin was actually a rather insignificant one with only a few thousand speakers. In fact, the language came close to being lost pretty much forever. There was one other group who had been there far longer and they were a thriving and dominant superpower who lived luxuriously and ruled with a mysterious language. <laughs> That's right, the Etruscans. Now, the Etruscans even dominated the seas around Italy and had a reputation as pirates, although some say that the Greeks just made that up. The Etruscan language, which didn't come from the same Indo-European language family as Latin, was very important in the development of Latin writing. It had some bizarre, unique features, which I'll show you a little bit later on. You are really going to love that. But if Etruscan was so big and Latin was so small, then how in the world did Latin not only survive extinction, but manage to weave its golden thread through the ancient and modern worlds so successfully. Thank goodness for those feral twins, right? Whether or not Romulus himself founded Rome, it didn't take long for the Latins of Rome to become the strongest people of all. The other Latins weren't even considered Roman citizens and never had any Latin rights. Thing is, Romans were very resourceful. Or maybe shrewd is a better word. They formed a Latin-speaking military and seized all the best farms. And before long, Latin was the language of the farmers, the soldiers, and the city dwellers. And as a new language of prestige, well, people just couldn't resist that, just like we saw in our other stories of the French and Spanish languages. But these were dangerous days. You needed allies. And so Rome got the other Latins to sign a treaty of mutual protection with them against non-Latins. Very smart. And 
we can actually sign our own treaty of mutual protection, mutual support right now. If you like, all you've got to do is click these three buttons, you see, and now we're allies. How about those powerful Etruscans though? Well, that is a long story, but for years, there was a whole series of wars between the Romans and the Etruscans, but the Roman military, those guys became incredibly strong and eventually even the Etruscans couldn't fight them anymore. So through a combination of farming and soldiering, Latin spread far and wide. But hold on a sec, why were the Romans known as Romans and not Latins? Yet their language was called Latin, and not Roman. Well, it's simple. Since Rome was where they started, they were known as the Roman Kingdom. But Latin was the language of all Latium, not just of Rome. By the way, if you're keen to see how Latin, the language, actually works, well, Luke is going to give you the scoop a little bit later on. To figure out how ancient civilizations actually spoke, we rely on written clues. And Latin writing is at least two and a half thousand years old, probably even older, which means that they didn't take long at all to get writing. And if you caught my hint earlier, well, they had a little help. We have evidence for this around the time of the, the founding in Rome. There's the Lapis Niger, for example. And we see a writing system which is definitely somewhat more similar to the Etruscan alphabet as well as Western Greek alphabets. And this writing system shows us a lot about how Latin in that stage, which really isn't what we'd consider to be Latin yet, but it's proto-Latin, uh, how it sounded. Now we'll come back to that alphabet, but the Lapis Niger that Lou mentioned is a shrine that has on it one of the earliest known proto-Latin inscriptions. An even older cool find was a one-of-a-kind relic, a, a golden cloak pin called the Praeneste Fibula that had this inscription. The letters are Etruscan, but the message is in a form of Old Latin and gives us a super important glimpse into the archaic languages of the Italian peninsula. Now, if this looks to you like it's written backwards, well, you're not wrong, and I'll tell you more about this later, but here is a clue. Latin never used to have standard spelling or writing conventions at all, so the writer just wrote things any way he wanted. So next time you see the word sick after a misspelled quote, remember the Latins. It means, I know this is wrong, but don't blame me. The Latin alphabet is similar to alphabets like Etruscan and Ancient Greek in that it's alphabetical, that means it has both vowels and consonants represented in the written language, which was something that the Greeks developed. Before that, there existed the Phoenician alphabet, and the Phoenician alphabet generally doesn't mark any clear vowel sounds at all, just a few, we could say, important vowel sounds, uh, but not most of them. The Latin alphabet, or the Roman alphabet, those terms are interchangeable. This alphabet comes from Etruscan, but it is also influenced by other Western Greek alphabets. What we think of as the Greek alphabet is really the standardized form of the ancient Greek alphabet in late antiquity, that is, by the end of the Western Roman Empire. And the Latins, the Romans, later adopt the Etruscan alphabet and probably have some influence from Greek writing systems as well, developing the Latin alphabet that we still use everywhere today for so many languages. So the Latins borrowed the Etruscan alphabet and tweaked it to their liking. It's hardly surprising. Remember that for a long time, those Etruscans were the real big shots and the Romans were just the little people. The Etruscans, well, they, they taught the Romans a lot of things, not just the alphabet and numerals. It's also likely that certain Latin letters like B, O, and X came directly from Greek since Neo-Etruscan didn't have these. This is the Neo-Etruscan alphabet they started with, and this is the earliest known form of the Old Latin alphabet. Isn't that cool? Incidentally, a few words you use every day came via the Etruscan language, like the word window. The Latins originally had no word for window because well, they didn't have any. They lived in windowless houses. The only openings were doors and chimneys. Another word is person, which used to mean a theatrical mask. Interesting also is there were no lowercase letters at first. And if you ever carved the name on a tree trunk or even a slate tablet, because I know you've done that, I bet you would have used capital letters, right? There's a reason for that. The faster handwritten version was easier on wax or papyrus. And this over time evolved to the lowercase letters that we have today. But it was the days of beautiful handwriting and they wrote in cursive too. And just like us, they also complained about each other's illegible handwriting. It did get a little better after the third century when cursive was less wild and disorderly. You may even recognize some letters here. And if you're wondering where the spaces between words were, well, there weren't any. One new trick at a time, guys. So Old Latin was the original ancient language spoken before the first century BC, and it differed in a few ways from what's called Classical Latin, which came later. Classical Latin 
is the version we still learn today, by the way, and you'll see how it works in just a bit. One difference is Old Latin never had double consonants. Instead, they'd write a small mark above the single letter to show that it should be counted twice. It was called a sigilicus and looked a little bit like a sickle. Now, remember those ancient inscriptions on the relics? Well, there's something really interesting about them. Take a look at these arrows. They show the direction that you're supposed to read the text. So you go from right to left and then left to right and then right to left again. So something that Phoenician and early writing in Latin and ancient Greek and Etruscan all have in common is something that's called boustrephedon from uh, bou or bous, which is Greek for cow, and strophe, which is a turn, hence a, a strophe or a verse. Verse versus is the Latin translation of the Greek word strophe, meaning, uh, well, a strophe, the verse of a song for example. So the uh, the move like the cow, which is what my geology teacher told us long ago, uh, that when you go up the mountains, instead of exhausting yourself uh, going straight up, it's good to be the cow and do a boustrephedon movement, boustrephedon. This writing of letters in these languages from uh, right to left, left to right, back and forth is very common, especially in stone for ancient Greek, really until the Hellenistic period. That is the period of Alexander the Great, a few centuries before we get uh, the classical Rome that we think of. And this happened in early Latin inscriptions as well, but it was eventually uh, standardized to write from left to right for both ancient Greek and Latin. Move like a cow up a hill? I mean, talk about efficiency. That is one way to get through a lot more books. But wait, this isn't just backward writing, it's mirrored writing. Here's what it would look like in English. Could it get any harder? Also, early forms of the letters were oriented differently, such as the fact that the letter A, for example, which probably ultimately comes from an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic and then was adopted as part of the Phoenician writing system, it was uh, an oxide. So if you turn the letter A upside down, you get something that looks like an oxide with the horns and everything. But that shape eventually, for whatever reason, got rotated around into its current configuration. Fun fact, Leonardo da Vinci was rather fond of this writing style. And by the way, if you want to join the gang of Latin lovers out there, you can sign up for our brand new story learning Latin course, which I am extremely, extremely excited about. It's called Latin Uncovered, and you'll learn this beautiful Latin language through the power of story. And your teacher will be none other than Luke himself. And I have to say, this is one that I'm very, very excited about. A very exciting and rare collaboration for me. Now, the course itself is coming out soon, and who knows, by the time you watch this video, it may already be out. But either way, uh, you'll want to click the link in the description to find out more. If you want to go on the intellectual journey of a lifetime, then I really encourage you to check that out. After paying a visit to the Greeks and being awed by their progressive culture, the Romans got very creative with literature, music, poetry, comedy. They really couldn't let those Greeks outdo them. And thank goodness for that, because these writings are the absolute best examples we have of Latin. And that's a big clue as to why Latin is more alive than you think, which we'll get to a little bit later. Anyway, classical Latin was a very polished and refined language that was used by the upper classes, including the mighty Julius Caesar himself, who was a serious lover of words. He and other great Roman authors living between between 100 BC to 200 AD. Well, they wrote out their philosophies, their history, and even novels. But fancy or not, it was anything but boring. One of my favorite authors is Apuleius, and uh, he wrote the only complete, on, the first complete novel from antiquity. It's like science fiction. It's called The Golden Ass, or Metamorphosis. It's partially, if I recall, an inspiration for, or it seems to be, I don't know if it's factually an inspiration for Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Puck becomes a donkey. Well, this character does too, the main character. Because there's far more details, but it's fascinating because the main character, he's interested in witchcraft, so he travels this part of Greece to go, because he hears there's like um, there's uh, magic there. He wants to learn the art of magic. And then he, through doing that, which is lots of really interesting real world situations, which are entertaining, but he ends up getting turned into a donkey, into an ass. And then he is enslaved. And so it's interesting because he has kind of the metaphor of being an animal, an enslaved animal, like enslaved humans are in that time period. Yeah, Latin could be pretty sick when it wanted to. Pause and check out these gems here. Don't say I don't give you good weapons, but Look, how do we know what Latin actually sounded like? Okay, obviously the Romance languages we speak today, so the Spanish, Italian, and so on, they tell us a lot about how Latin probably would have sounded since Latin is where these languages came from, and certain sounds are very similar among the different Romance languages, which is another clue. But there are actually far better clues in written things, Roman grammar books, transcriptions into other ancient languages, poetry, and here's a fun surprise, Roman spelling mistakes. Yes, well, we'll get to why bad spelling was actually a godsend for us in just a minute, but first, 
the poetry. The grammarians explain in great detail how poetry works and how the rhythm works in a poem. To use a poem that I happen to have memorized, and I use a lot for an example of this kind of thing, is a poem by Ovid. No nego no biliun sedeo studioso secorum, cui tamen ipsa faves, winca tutile precor. Ut loquer arte cum veni, te cumque sedere, ne tibino notus quem facis eset amor. And going on there, we can hear that there's a distinct difference between long and short syllables, that the arrangement of the line is based on something called a dactyl, which is named after the Greek word for finger, which is uh, dactylos. So a dactyl, which that's because the finger has a long and then two short pieces uh, to it, such uh, also has um, this, uh, this meter, this uh, meter of poetry in both Latin and ancient Greek. So, non neko no biliun sedeo. The Romans also wrote highly detailed accounts of how the language works. For example, Quintilian said that the letters K, C, and Q have fundamentally the same sound, K. In fact, he didn't think that we needed the letter K at all, which tells us that the letter C never made the soft S sound that it does now in English and most Romance languages. It was almost always a hard sound, K. Another example is the letter V, which had two sounds, but neither was a V. It was sometimes a U and sometimes a W. The best way we know this is from transcriptions of Latin words into other languages. For example, the Roman name Valerius is transcribed as Ualerius in Greek transcriptions. So does that mean that wine wasn't called vino, but uino? Absolutely. Now, if you think bad spelling only happens in modern times, well, think again. Ancient people were wired for word blunders just like we are and inadvertently left a tons of pronunciation clues. You see, bad spellers usually write words the way they are pronounced phonetically, right? We do the same if we're not sure about a word. Julius Caesar probably wasn't making spelling mistakes, but a stick of charcoal in the hands of a guy called Rufus, well, the ancient city walls of Pompeii were decorated with over 11,000 graffiti messages, names, dialogues, gossip about a particular girl called Romula who had 1,000 men round for tea. Presumably. The useful part, listen to this, is words that don't match the typical spelling. For example, look at this graffiti from the House of Lovers. Amantis and Apis are supposed to be spelled like this. So the incorrect spelling tells us something. It tells us that this was either a dialect or maybe the writer was trying to sound archaic, but either way, they spelled the words the way that they said them. In another part of this message, they left off the final M of Melitum, which tells us that it wasn't pronounced, but there are thousands of examples like this, and we now know that the silent M meant that they nasalized the preceding vowel. Now you will like this one about how to pronounce the letter R. So a Roman satirist called Gaius Lucilius compared R to the sound of a dog. <laughs> So there you go, if you can't roll your R's, just try growling them. And then you had writers with a sense of humour. Sometimes for a laugh, they'd include bad characters who spoke bad Latin. And obviously from that context, we know what was considered poor Latin. Now I hardly need to tell you that the Romans and their descendants went wandering the earth and spread the Latin language far and wide. That's what the Romans did. They occupied Britain from about 43 to 410 AD, and in Europe, classical Latin was a lingua franca of science, academia, religion, literature, and international communication until well into the 18th century. But along the way, classical Latin lost some of its complexity. You see, after the Roman Empire fell, ordinary people didn't care about sophisticated language. They were mostly illiterate, and they spoke what's called vulgar Latin, which was very simplified local dialects. And these were always changing and getting further away from classical Latin. And if you're wondering what vulgar Latin was like, well, we'll ask Luke in a bit. Now, as for why the Roman Empire collapsed, well, you can blame the hordes of axe-wielding Germanic tribes who plundered the empire and took Latin slaves and sat down to watch the sunset with a beer. That's right, it was those barbarians who made beer manly again. And funny thing, they actually decided to ditch their Germanic language and took on the local Latin language. Why? I have no idea. And if you're curious about how those Germanic languages ended up leading to English, well, you can find out more about that in this video here. But in 476 AD, the last Roman emperor was ceremoniously booted out. I mean, the kid was only 12, poor thing. And a certain guy called Odoacer made himself king of Italy. So all those Latins ended up living in scattered villages again. It's not surprising that vulgar Latin fragmented along with them and eventually became the Romance languages that we know today. French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, Catalan, and so on. Ever wondered how far each of them strayed from Latin? From Latin, I should read. In cucina, a una parte, i brutti molenti su molenti, a una parte questi spaffiani nostri. 
In terms of languages that are close to Latin and still around today, well, those closest to farthest would go in this order. Sardinian, very close to Latin, Italian, Spanish, Romanian, Portuguese. And then somewhere in the middle there, we've got Occitan and Catalan as well. Linguists tend to disagree on the exact order of proximity to Latin, and that is fine with me because linguists, well, they disagree on pretty much everything. Sardinian might have been the first language to split off from Latin. And as you just heard, Sardinian dialects from remote areas can give you a wonderful glimpse into the old language, the way it used to be. The most divergent of all is French, which has got a heavy dose of Germanic languages, which in turn ties French to English, which is pretty cool. So how much Latin do we actually have in English then? Well, 29% of English comes directly from Latin, but with all the words that came via other languages, it's more like 60 to 70%. See how it works here. When it comes to vocabulary to do with science and technology, that number uh, goes up to 90%, which is quite incredible if you think about it. But what's more, a huge amount of our Germanic words actually have Latin twins. Think of uh, all those animal adjectives like equine for horse. Vocabulary is where it stops though, because Latin had very little influence on English grammar. But with all those words, you're going to easily recognize what an easy start you'll have if you get into Latin as an English speaker. And trust me, you do not have to sound like a stuffy old medieval king. Now, before we get to the fun stuff, let's see how Latin actually works. Latin's closest living relatives are the Romance languages. The five national, shall I say, uh, Romance languages are Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, and Romanian, though there are other important ones like uh, Catalan, Sicilian, Sardinian, and something that those languages all have in common is masculine and feminine gender. Well, how is Latin different? It has a neuter gender. They also have uh, verb conjugation. There's a lot of inflection in the verb conjugations in the Romance languages. And Latin is yet more highly inflected when it comes to the verbs. And the nouns are inflected. Latin has a case system. And in English, our case system is almost gone as far as the inflections, meaning the endings or the way that the nouns and pronouns and adjectives, the way that they show themselves, it's almost gone. We inflect for plural and singular, right? So cow, cows but ox, oxen, we have a few irregular ones. Uh, we also inflect the pronouns uh, fairly well. So I, me, my, she, her, her, for they, them, their, we, us, our. Those are all inflections of pronouns. And those same changes for possession, for direct object, those same changes are present in the, pretty much for every single noun in Latin. A really important feature of Latin and it's also based, these differences of inflection are based primarily on phonemic vowel length differences. And I'd say this part of the pronunciation of Latin is by far the most important, and because it's critical to the grammar. The difference between rosa, a rose, and rosa, by means of the rose, those are very different. If you just say rosa, you know, it's, it's a rose, but rosa, by means of the rose, like what happens? So whatever the verb is in the sentence will greatly change the meaning of things. And the vowel length is the critical factor. It's, that's the, the main way that Latin works. And this flexibility that results because of the highly inflected system gives Latin a great deal of expressive ability in its syntax. So its word order is really flexible. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Classical Latin sounds hard. Can't I just learn that kind of casual old vulgar Latin or something? I mean, what are the different kinds of Latin anyway? So vulgar Latin is a term which has a different meaning for different people. It's been used in all kinds of ways through the centuries. And it derives from the word vulgus, which means the people. So to call something vulgaris in Latin means it's common. And thus, if one is elitist, can have a negative connotation, but not necessarily. You know, the way that I um, am speaking is essentially vulgar English. And other people speak English in different ways. Other people speak in a cleaner way, more literary way, and people speak in more colloquial ways as we see it. So that's a good, a good comparison to what the non-standard forms of Latin were like back then. So what is vulgar Latin and what is it referring to? Well, for Dante, it referred to the idea that all the non-standard forms of Latin, that is the Romance languages or Proto-Romance languages, that they're all vulgar Latin. I mean, the term etymologically makes sense. It's of the people, the common people. It's uh, therefore also meant to imply that during classical Roman times, nobody actually spoke 
the written classical Latin because medieval people and Renaissance people would learn to speak Latin fluently, but they grew up speaking a completely different language, the predecessor to modern Portuguese and Spanish and French and Catalan and Italian and Sicilian and so forth. This gave the impression that it was always like that, and thus this vulgar Latin always existed, but it didn't. Well, the Proto-Romance languages, they all developed from a common Latin that was uh, spoken by the middle class. In uh, the later Western Roman Empire, the result is that Latin ended up diverging, which makes a lot of sense. The way it was kept as a sort of more or less singular dialect, a rather consistent dialect up until like the 4th or 5th century AD, in fact, is uh, because of that commerce. So once that commerce broke down, it becomes a lot more fragmented, thus creating the Romance languages. Bottom line is you cannot learn vulgar Latin. It's simply just not a thing anymore. But you are going to try speaking Latin in just a little bit. So get those talking muscles warmed up. And I'll spare you the dramatic quotes. They'll be useful ones. In the Middle Ages, ordinary folk stopped speaking Latin, and you'd mostly hear it among the educated high class and in churches. And maybe that's when the spoken language started slipping into the twilight zone a little bit. But it's an incredibly important time in history because the vast majority of manuscripts preserved from this era are in Latin. Seriously, Latin and Greek writing told us most of what we know about the history of the Western world. Medieval Latin changed a lot, mostly in terms of vocabulary and the way that words were actually spelled. People kind of molded the language to suit themselves, borrowing words from Vulgar Latin and their own native languages. Even poetry lost its classical rhythm. And did I mention the drinking songs? And though they were not influenced by all that charming graffiti that we talked about earlier, Pompeii was buried for centuries when Vesuvius erupted in 75 AD, awaiting its resurrection as it turned out. During the Renaissance in Europe, they tried to purge Latin of all the horrible things it had picked up during medieval times. They really didn't like the medieval habits, and this uh, Latin got derogatory names like Gothic and barbaric jargon. The Renaissance form of Latin is what guys like Dante were using, and it was elegant for sure, but not entirely useful. Of course, Dante went and broke all the rules when he wrote the Divine Comedy in Italian, and you can catch that gripping story in this video if you want. Anyway, the purified Latin gradually became the new Latin of the 16th to 19th centuries. Can you imagine if all English dialects in the world had to be standardized now to say Shakespearean English? It would be complete anarchy, or the potentially quite amusing. But that's what happened with Latin. That old classical style just kind of kicked off its tombstone. Big question though, can Latin be fully revived? Well, it's not likely unless you know of some native speakers. A language needs to be commonly spoken in order for it to evolve. So next time you hear people just casually speaking Latin at a bar, please film it and send it in. Mind you, Luke is doing a brilliant job of making Latin fun again. <laughs> non, anadine, non locor. <laughs> And I'm trying to do that too, although I haven't been invited to those Latin only Friday nights, Luke. But modern Latin has some very innovative grammar going on and some new words as well. For example, in classical Latin, there is no word for that. You'd have to say something like, I think it to be. But modern Latin does have a conjunction for that. Some people like this, others hate it and prefer to stick to the classical grammar and only use new vocabulary if they absolutely have to. Like an airplane, for example. How are you going to use the ancient Latin word for airplane? So if you are at all concerned about what kind of Latin to learn, well, don't be. The only real differences are in pronunciation, because there are all kinds. Ecclesiastical, classical. Ecclesiastical Latin is the official language of the Vatican City, by the way, and perhaps has more of an Italian sound to it, but they are all mutually intelligible and they're not really that different. It's really not a big deal which kind you like to learn. It's a bit like you know, British or American English, it's pretty much the same. Now, earlier I asked you to guess how many truly fluent Latin speakers there are out there. Well, let's find out. I'd say 10, 20,000 at a basic level of fluency is an estimate. Really high levels of fluency, a few thousand maybe. It sounds to me like we have stumbled upon the perfect secret language here, guys. Forget Klingon, just learn Latin. Now, Luke has some fun phrases that you can practice right now, and I dare you to try out a line or two on someone that you meet today, especially number three. In we no veritas. In we no veritas. The V in Latin makes a W sound in the classical pronunciation. Acta non verba. Acta uh, 
non verba. Barba non facit philosopum. A beard doesn't make a philosopher, I wish. Omnia mea me comporto. All that is mine I carry with me. So after all of this, how living, how alive is Latin? Well, let's see. Latin is technically dead since it doesn't have any native speakers, but it is possible to speak the language fluently. It is pretty much the exact same language of the classical authors, so well preserved in writing that it really can't be buried, but it also can't evolve. So this is looking more and more like Latin kind of got frozen in time and like a Roman god became an immortal, which is seriously cool. In order to read, and read what? Anything. All kinds of things. From all around history. From, oh gosh, 2,500 years ago. At least 2,300 for the good stuff. To the present. People continue to write in Latin. And history of Europe. And of other places too. Has been written in Latin. And so little has been translated. So to have access to it. Do you want to be dependent on a translator? Do you want to be able to access it directly? So Latin gives you that. So that's a hugely important reason. The poetry, that's a tremendously good reason. And the friendships that you make, if you have any interest in interacting with people who speak Latin or like to read Latin, oh, it's tremendous. So it's, uh, I'd say those are my uh, top five reasons. So as I mentioned earlier, I've actually teamed up with Luke to create Latin Uncovered, which is a brand new course from story learning to learn the beautiful Latin language through the power of stories. It is a wonderful project and you can find more information about that by following the link right here, along with another language story, which is every bit as fascinating as Latin. And it also involves a three-headed dragon. Watch it if you dare.